Welcome to another edition of Second Thoughts, where I take a look at a current cartoon's recent seasons that I've previously reviewed. Things changed a little from the last time I did this. From now on, Second Thoughts is relegated to one show per video. This is to help streamline it and to also allow me to keep up with current shows much easier. I'm also not going to be in my jazz lounge and keep it sort of akin to my movie thoughts videos, but the main goal is still the same. Now you may be asking why I made these changes in the first place. <laughs> Can you like, shut up? Now although the venue has changed, the rules remain the same. I won't be reviewing any shows that I haven't covered in a while, so no Castlevania or DuckTales, though the final seasons were total sex. And I won't be covering any shows that are just plain sitcoms and known only for their comedy more than anything. Only overarching narrative driven shows here folks. So let's not waste any more time and just pop this pimple. So there's definitely been some significant changes to Amphibia since the last time I looked at it. Back when I first reviewed it, I mainly only had the first episode to go off of, but it was able to leave a good impression on me, and by the end of the year, the season had wrapped up, granted in a very ineffective daily summer bomb format, but that's a complaint for another day. Whore. I should also correct the record from that last review when I accidentally called Anne Taiwanese when she's actually just Thai. I really want to apologize for that, I'm an idiot. Idiot! But anyway, the first season was overall fun and gave a lot of growth to Anne and even to some of the planter family like Sprague with him gaining more of a backbone and all that. But the second season definitely built on everything even more. We saw good moments of Anne's development actually sticking and growing even more. We got moments of her being proactive and wanting to help the planters with their home. Granted, it resulted in a giant vegetable monster destroying the house, but you know, baby steps. We saw an excellent moment of her learning to connect more with nature, which I think plays into the finale, but we'll get into that when we get to that. We saw good moments of Anne being more responsible this time around, with her taking some of the moral high ground on things, or just being plain right about stuff like the acting troupe episode where Hop Hop almost got the family tied up in petty thefts, and Anne with the only one thinking straight. Never trust traveling theater folk, kids. You'll come down with a major case of the thespians. But enough play on play action. We did get really good standout moments for the planter family in general. Sprig got a pretty strong moment with him and Anne when he reveals to her that him and Polly's parents died, particularly his mom, when Anne was venting about how much she missed her mom. You know, I've always wondered, can you miss someone you never actually knew? <laughs> That's silly. I mean, of course you can't. Listen, if you didn't feel this, your soul is just lost to the ether somewhere, I don't know what else to tell you, it's such a great moment between them. It honestly is very nice because you see how much it affects Sprig, because his thing is like he never got to know his own mom. It's honestly sad, and even Anne feels for it, it's like to not know your mom, it's kind of tragic. Hop Hop got some nice development when they followed up on him burying the music box. I'll admit at first the episode didn't grab me as much since it felt a little anticlimactic with how they wrapped it up with Anne being hurt by Hop Hop's actions but forgiving him in the end. He did have a good reason with him just wanting to keep Polly and Sprig safe since their parents were killed by herons that attacked Wartwood once but you can't help but feel like there could have been a little more to it by the end. Thankfully there was with them showing that the tensions were pretty high between Anne and Hop Hop in the following episode. Look, I want things to go back to the way they were, but, but... <sighs> I'm sorry, Anne. You take all the time you need. Maybe it's enough to admit we've still got issues, instead of pretending they don't exist. <laughs> I think that'd be good. It lets you know they're not in the best spot right now, and it will take some time for them to get back to what their friendship was. I honestly appreciate that they followed up on that. Polly was given good moments of bonding with Sprig, with them having to learn to deal with their differences. She even got some good moments to bond with Anne even more. Granted, it almost resulted in them destroying a city, but who hasn't gone on a bender before with their friends? There was also a new element introduced with this robot they dubbed Frobo. I get it! It basically works under Polly's command, which gives Polly a good sense of responsibility since she has to take care of it. They definitely gave more to Polly this season, which I genuinely appreciate. I did think she needed just a bit more from the last season, and they definitely followed through on that here. Hi there! My name's Marshy.
I'm not fucking done. She's fucking dead. Marcy definitely brings something different to the show. She's pretty eccentric and pretty accident prone. Oh man! Huh. Where'd I be without you? Marcy! Oh, no, come on! There wasn't even any fire this time! Oh my gosh, Anne! I'm about to beat my all-time record! I'm so happy for you! It does beg the question how she's been able to stay alive for so long. But she is a fun character that does let herself get lost in whatever she's hyper-focusing on. She may be a genius, but that can get her into trouble because of how much she gets lost in her work. And basically took it upon herself to try to protect her whenever she tries to do something or is just focusing too much and almost about to get hurt. But you get a good moment of Marcy proving to Anne that she's not some klutz that needs coddling like she did back home. You see the great dynamic between these two and how they were friends for so long, but you can't help but have some uneasiness linger in the back of your mind since you do remember she was with Sasha in goading Anne into stealing the music box that sent them there in the first place. So you do wonder what is up with her. It's definitely something that's going to be in your mind as you watch the season. Granted, it does kind of get pushed back in the back of your mind as you watch because she's just such a gosh darn likable character. And speaking of Sasha, she even gets more this time around with how she and Grimes basically choose to overthrow the kingdom of Newtopia, where Marcy is basically a royal guard there. Sasha becomes power hungry as hell to the point that she fakes making up with Anne when she meets back up with her. She even got so into trying to take over the Newt kingdom that she disregarded her friends Percy and Braddock's well-being when they went after a powerful warhammer and put them in danger even after she promised she'd stop if they said to. Wow, what an asshole! So yeah, Grimes ended up getting some love with him basically becoming a slob and rebuilding himself back up. I really enjoyed the angle they went with for Sasha and Grimes having a good friendship, even if it can mean distraction for everyone else, though it did get me thinking about this one theory. So let's try to make this crystal clear. Yes, I'm stealing your shtick, Ostrog Vox, don't sue me. With Sasha wanting to stay and help Grimes take over, you gotta wonder why. She could just go make up with Anne and try to find a way home, but she's choosing to prolong her stay in Amphibia. And that got me thinking, what if Sasha doesn't want to go back? Now you might be thinking, what's making me say that? Well, one thing. Anne clearly wants to get back to her home, which she constantly talks about, be it her mom or her pet or something from Earth, where Sasha never really mentions anything from home. So what if Sasha is actually an orphan? I mean, it would make sense. She doesn't seem to have much incentive to want to go home because there's no real home back on Earth for her. At the very least, she could just have a totally crappy home life with her parents being abusive, but I'm doubtful Disney would allow that. I would hope we get some clarity on the next season, but for now, it's just a theory. A film theory. Oh, no! All right, back to business. This season did build more on the world this time with Anne and the planters leaving for the kingdom of Newtopia. With the gang traveling around, they came across some fun characters that definitely leave a good impression. Whether it's the mini frogs that can rip people to shreds. Or meeting a con man who has a very familiar demeanor to him. Who the fuck is this? We got a great abundance of characters that flesh out the world of Amphibia beyond Wartwood. Now, most of them were fun one-offs that we're not too likely to see again, especially since some of them are very much dead. He's dead. Mm -hmm. But there are definitely a few major standouts, one being General Yunan. Scourge of the Sand Wars, defeater of Ragnar the Wretched, and... The youngest newt to ever achieve the rank of general in the great Newtopian army! Yeah, she's pretty overzealous and just downright bloodthirsty with her mission to take out Grimes from the Newtopia kingdom. Yunin, Scourge of the Sand Wars, defeater of Ragnar the Wretched, the youngest newt to ever achieve the rank of general in the great Newtopian army! Right. 
Anyway, Yunnan has this fun, crazy sense of determination to her and can kind of scare the crap out of you. Some general you are. Where's your army? I had an army once. They slowed me down. I think I just myself. Yeah, she's someone who very much leaves a lasting impression. Definitely one of my personal favorites out of all of the new characters introduced this season. Ain't no forgetting General Yunnan. Scourge of the Sand Wars, defeater of Ragnar the Rich oh, and I get it! But she's not the only new face from Newtopia we got. King Andreas makes a big impression. <laughs> he rules over Newtopia, but as a pretty cool and fun king. Like for real, you could just easily like this guy. He's just so giddy and a plain delight. Doesn't help that he's voiced by the great Keith David. We're not worthy! We're not worthy! We're not worthy! We're scum! Though with him being so nice and pleasant, you do get a feeling that there is something brewing underneath. You see him propose a deal with Marcy, but the details are not yet revealed, and then you see him meeting some mysterious entity and talk about revenge, so you know some deeper shit is about to go down. At the beginning of the season, we were left to believe that Anne and the gang were probably gonna stay in Utopia for the remainder of the time. But they actually end up returning to Wartwood midway through the season, and we got some good growth of a few fan favorites. Ivy gets a nice episode dedicated to her to learn there's more to her mother than she originally thought. Finding out that her mom's prim and proper ways were just to help her be ready to take on the world when it came time to join her mother on her excursions. It allowed for more of Ivy's character, which I greatly appreciate seeing, as a way to establish there's more to her than just being Sprague's boo. Not to say that they aren't really cute together because they're freaking adorable, but I digress. Maddie even got some love with her episode that focused on her annoyance with being a big sister. She basically got older and wanted to be independent from her triplet sisters, but they still just want to have a sister to play with, which gave her a nice character moment. I really enjoy what they did here. I also really like the team up with Maddie and Marcy. Those two look like they'd cause chaos if they were together and they absolutely didn't disappoint. We even got some redemption from Mayor Toadstool with him actually wanting to protect the town from the Toads. He could have easily aligned with his Toad brethren, but he chose the townspeople instead. A great follow up to this one moment in the season one finale that I really am glad they followed up on. We saw the introduction to the three temples that were important to recharge the gems to the music box. The temples were able to build upon the girls and their strengths perfectly, it allowed them to be more aware of their own flaws and overcome them. It can get you hyped if they all team up together to do battle against some major entity. There's some that gets you to wonder what's going to happen there when Anne doesn't let her gem fully charge. Definitely some foreshadowing and a half going on there. Now, with the new season comes a bit of an upgrade with the animation and designs, and boy did they upgrade. This season called for a lot of strong expressions from the characters that were just pure fun and some being gut-wrenching at times as well. There was a strong concerted effort put into the unique designs the show was going for. Some that leave you horrified like the frog who wears a skin suit made out of other frogs' skin. Jesus Christ! or all the new characters we got to see that could have a strong silhouette to them. This was a massive step up in style for this series, but we're not finished just yet. So this season had a lot of ups to it. We got to see new characters, get to know them, and manage to grow attached to them. And then the season finale just bitch slapped us like we stole something. So much happened in the finale that this season built up perfectly. Sasha and Grimes finally enact their plan to take over the kingdom, driving a bigger wedge between her and Anne. But the funny thing is, it turns out they were technically right in trying to take over since it was revealed that Andreas had his own plans of conquest. Once Anne and the gang stop Sasha and Grimes in the Toad Rebellion, Andreas reveals his ultimate plan of using the music box to turn the castle into a flying fortress to conquer other dimensions like Anne, Sasha, and Marcy's. What a twist! He reveals how he was betrayed by a frog and a toad thousands of years ago when they took the music box and sent it to Anne's world. He basically isolated himself off until the time was right, which was the music box finally returning to him. He even goes on about how people forgot about how they was kings type shit. It's insane. 
but that's not where the tyranny ends for him. He ends up outing Marcy, which leads us to find out she basically planned for her and the girls to get sent to Amphibia and how Marcy found out about the music box and why she was on board with Anne stealing it. It ends up being from the fact that her parents were moving and she would have had to leave both Sasha and Anne behind. And he sent us to a place where we'd never have to grow apart, where the three of us could be friends forever together. How could you? I've been missing my parents, my life. But look at how much fun we've had. Look at how much you've both grown. Look at Sprig, I gave you this. I gave you everything. I just didn't want to be alone. Now, this honestly is all excellent and so heavy in emotionality because you get the genuine feeling of anguish and betrayal in the entire scene, all driven by Marcy's fear of being alone. Now, I will say one thing I think could have been done a smidge differently, and Rebecca Rose, whose channel you should check out, pointed this out, was the order of the reveal for Marcy. The episode starts with a flashback showing Marcy finding out about the music box, and we see she was upset by something her parents said to her, but that gets later revealed that she was going to be moving away. I think the flashback as a whole should have been when Marcy was outed. It would have landed a lot harder because the audience wouldn't have any suspicions, whereas it being in the beginning leaves you already suspecting something's wrong, especially since Marcy looked so upset when she ran out of her house. That's just something I feel could have been arranged differently for a strong impact on the audience. I will say seeing Marcy absolutely devastated by being rejected by Anne and everybody for trapping them there also hits you really hard considering the fact that she was so happy-go-lucky. And to see her completely crushed, panicking and pleading to her friends is really effective. You get why she did what she did, but deep down she knows she was wrong, especially since she's the big planner who usually knows what to do, but this time her ideas can't save her from her own mistake. Cosmic. But there's still so much more that we got from this finale, for you see, Polly finally sprouts her legs, which was foreshadowed early when we first met up with Marcy. It was a pretty hype moment. <laughs> But a real big twist was Anne. Turns out Anne is a freaking super saiyan. Like holy shit, she basically just got like this after Andreas tossed Sprig from out of the castle. Thankfully Marcy was able to save him, but not before Anne basically went insane and drew the power from the gem she had connection with. It was such a hype moment and was even more emphasized with the fact that the animation fucking popped off. It became so fluid and it added a much needed gravitas to the whole situation. Anne moved so swiftly and put Andrews on the ropes, that is, until she started losing control and the power faded away. So it just leaves you waiting and hoping for her to gain control of that power next season. We even managed to get a little bit of General Yunnan helping on the side of Anne and the planters and all that. And I'm kind of wondering what happens next because she doesn't escape or anything. She actually helps and fights with the planters and all that. It's kind of one of those, hmm. Where's this gonna go next season? I'm really wondering what they do with that. Things take a turn once Marcy gets her hands on the music box to open a portal. Anne and the planters manage to escape through with Sasha and Grimes holding back Andreas. And Marcy... <laughs> yeah, they actually showed Marcy being impaled. They didn't hide away from it or nothing. You see her practically lifeless body fall over. This most likely was the scene that got them to delay the episode from its initial premiere date, which was dumb considering Disney killed a baby once in the Tarzan movie. Whore. But that's another complaint for another day. We're still not at where it ends. We find out Anne and the planters landed in Anne's world, and then we got the season 3 opening showing off some new characters and situations that are likely to happen, including that Marcy is in some healing chamber slash possible transfer tube to this weird crazy black entity in the background. I do get the feeling that Disney said to include that just so kids wouldn't be too upset with what happened to Marcy. I'm just like, screw that, let those pipsqueaks suffer, fuck them kids. But I digress. It was so much. When I say this finale had me shaking, I very much mean it. Hands literally trembling like I had the shakes. It was a total roller coaster and a half with how crazy it got with twist after twist. 
we got a lot of callbacks to everything set up previously within the season, from Pop Pop's acting to the factory of Frobo's being used by Andreas to Anne making a connection to nature and still having the power of the gem left in her to be able to pull from it. It was fantastic all the way through. There was just greatness throughout the whole season with strong character moments, good buildup of the lore, and amazing revelations and emotional moments that all makes this a phenomenal season. With season 3 possibly being in the last season, but you know the saying. Don't quote me boy cause I ain't said shit. If you're still waiting to get into Amphibia, I think now is the perfect time to hop on board. But that's just a thought. Thank <laughs> you.